Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dennis, for the, the introduction there. I think my presentation is very different to the previous two presentations. Uh, and uh, I've taken upon myself uh, to put that title out to Dennis, Driving Excellence in Industrial R&D. So, so there's, I suppose, three words. One is driving, the other is excellence, and the other is industrial R&D. Uh, that is quite a challenge. Uh, and so that's what this presentation is about, to look at that question of excellence in industrial R&D. I suppose when we look uh, nationally, uh, we have the Innovation 2020 document there, uh, and on the very front page of that you see the word excellence. So, uh, excellence, what, what does it mean? Uh, I think there's, uh, uh, in R&D and innovation, uh, there's an underlying uh, need that R&D be measurable, I think, when I read that document. Uh, greater focus on the impact of R&D uh, and then also the ability to assess uh, uh, industrial R&D. Uh, so, uh, if I just reflect on uh, R&D, then I can see that there's actually different perspectives and different understandings of R&D depending on who's looking at it. So, uh, I put down five classifications there, it may not be complete, uh, but you do have the university uh, and research institutes R&D. Uh, the funding agencies look at R&D from their perspective as well like Enterprise Ireland and the IDA. Uh, revenue look at R&D as well from another perspective, uh, also from a legislative pers perspective. Consultants look at it and then the industries and companies. So they're all looking at R&D and I think the understanding can be different depending on the perspective that you're looking at it from. So I'm going to focus more on the industry uh, side. So in terms of academia, uh, I think we can talk and uh, I think I can convince you that there are good metrics uh, for assessing R&D, uh, for excellence in R&D uh, uh, globally. Uh, so we have some parameters like the uh, world class, the ERC is a good example of excellence, uh, a body that, that oversees excellence. And then we have our metrics such as publications, citations, numbers of PhDs supervised, uh, income generated uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, at the moment there's an excellence initiative in Germany uh, and uh, I'm sitting on a commission overseeing the 5 billion investment uh, in excellence, the excellent universities uh, in, in Germany. So uh, we do have our metrics and uh, they're, they're pretty pretty well globally accepted as metrics for academia. Uh, but then uh, for me, uh, this is the challenge I've taken upon myself is, uh, can we define excellence uh, in the industrial context? Uh, and it surprised me about five years ago when I started to look to see uh, are there any good metrics out there, are there, are there good ways of assessing or the, and to my surprise, Actually, I didn't see much. There's not that much about uh, how to measure excellence uh, uh, in uh, R&D. So that's the challenge, and it's a very, uh, a very challenging challenge I've, uh, I'm facing into. I suppose if I look at comparing university-type R&D and uh, industrial R&D, uh, some of the key points would be listed here, like KPIs uh, are different. Uh, you can see them there. Uh, the time frame is different. The technology readiness level is different. The motivation is different, uh, and the, uh, the, the uh, I suppose the leading edge research uh, and the leading edge products and services. So, so there's uh, quite different and distinct uh, I suppose uh, classifications of what excellence in, in R&D would mean for the two different ones. And in the centre there, there is an interface, and that interface uh, maybe at a technology readiness level of four to eight. Uh, that's a pretty critical interface. Uh, there is a body uh, called Fraunhofer. Uh, and Fraunhofer uh, is a, a global organization uh, that sits right at that interface and it professionalizes the interface between university and industry. I do quite a lot of work with Fraunhofer, pretty large organization at 2.1 uh, billion uh, and about 24,500 staff. So they're sitting since 1949 at that interface uh, looking at it. So they would have opinions and views about excellence uh, in uh, R&D. They are a global organization, so the voice of Fraunhofer would be reasonably representative in the, the global perspective. Uh, just to say, there is a representative office for Fraunhofer here in UCD, uh, and there's a new Fraunhofer center just about to open in Dublin City University in the area of microfluidics. Uh, so, uh, just some of my own experiences, I suppose. I, I did some work with this new technology company called uh, Open Hydro. Uh, and uh, we've designed and built that machine there. So that's a 16-meter turbine for tidal stream electricity generation. 
Uh, and uh, I, uh, I was a former director before we sold that company uh, to a French submarine manufacturer, but uh, I also uh, chaired the R&D board there for about 10 years. So we have a structure and processes in place. Uh, and I think that is, it's reasonable to argue that we succeeded in getting a lot of funding as a result of having proper processes and structures uh, in place in that company. Uh, a second example, uh, completely different, uh, much more mature technology, but on injection molding. Uh, if you look at some of these slides here, uh, you can see that there's a very high level of complexity in the systems there in, in the injection molding uh, tooling design. Uh, and again, there's a lot of development, a lot of R&D uh, in behind that. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, in, in some cases, it's classical design, but then in other cases, it's much deeper. It's going into the R&D uh, perspective. So there is a question around where, you, where do you put a boundary between design and, uh, and R&D. Uh, another company that I'm doing some work with is called Anum. Uh, they're in the business of SMS text messaging. Uh, I'm also chairing their R&D board, uh, and I just come in on their main board there. Uh, and uh, what, what I've recommended to them is that they set up an R&D board, that they have eight R&D meetings per year, that they have an agenda and they have minutes. Uh, so they're starting, uh, we've initiated, let's say, a couple of years ago, the formal processes of doing uh, R&D in the company. I suppose some of the objectives might be interesting here. One is uh, moving from retrospective to real-time monitoring of the R&D activity. Uh, the, a lot of companies are not in that position. Uh, have an ability to interrogate the system uh, to get uh, an instantaneous response to what revenue would classify as the science and the accounting test. So the ability to report in real time and then achieving excellence, in other words, moving, this, uh, for me there's two different things, compliance and excellence, and so making the shift from compliance uh, to excellence. So these are just three examples of areas that I've been working in in, in recent times. So, but I do think that as Dennis has uh, said, or as Martin has said, the ecosystem in Ireland has changed uh, and it's even more critical now that we're really efficient in our uh, R&D uh, processes, R&D and innovation processes. Uh, so if we look at revenue, for example, this is the 2015 uh, report, and there you see uh, areas like real-time uh, knowledge of customer behavior, uh, reliable prediction of where issues might arise. So, so there are developments at the assessment side of R&D as well uh, for industrial uh, for industrial R&D. Uh, so, uh, in behind, uh, many people may not really realise, but the legislation in Ireland is built around the OECD definitions of R&D, and that's very nicely structured in the. Frascati uh, definitions, uh, this is the 2015 one, and uh, R&D is broken down very nicely into these five uh, different categories. Uh, in, in addition to the uh, definitions for R&D, uh, interestingly the OECD also have their definitions of innovation, uh, and they've got four major blocks or more four major pillars uh, in their product process marketing and organization. So these, for me, are pretty good reference documents in terms of uh, looking at defining uh, R&D and, uh, and excellence in R&D. Uh, and then we have the more recent one of the knowledge development box, uh, which uh, comes through the modified nexus approach. Uh, so, uh, a lot happening there. So, uh, just let me come back then to the question of what is excellence in R&D uh, in the industrial context. And I've just put some words down there. So, world class for the industry sector. Uh, that is an excellent innovation in R&D culture. So culture is a very important word in leadership, that the, the processes and structures are in place, uh, that there's excellent national and international networks, uh, and then also that there's a close affiliation with the world best R&D practice uh, for the sector. And I suppose if we're hitting some of those things, uh, then uh, we're probably there in, in being up in that, that category. However, uh, I suppose uh, going back to an Irish man, uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, I, I like that there, what you can measure, you, uh, when you can measure what you were speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it, uh, maybe not all about it, but when you can express it in numbers, uh, your knowledge, or, or sorry, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager uh, and unsatisfactory kind. So that's quite nice, uh, and so I, I believe we need to move now into how do we measure uh, R&D and excellence uh, and uh, the, it is a complex subject, so I don't believe that we can measure it just quantitatively, but we have to have a combination of quantitative uh, and qualitative. 
Uh, so uh, quantitative metrics are needed here. And uh, I've turned my attention then to uh, quantitative matrix for the last couple of years uh, and uh, asking myself, you know, when we look at the developments in industry, like for example, uh, the shift uh, to industry 4.0 in what we call the fourth industrial revolution. On the y-axis there you see degrees of complexity. So R&D in industry is getting more and more complex uh, and therefore obviously more and more difficult to assess as well. Uh, and so uh, I just put this slide together here uh, with the increasing complexity uh, and increasing multidisciplinarity uh, of the environment for R&D. Uh, I believe that there's a fuzzy zone somewhere. So in certain uh, areas, we can say d definitively that uh, aspects are, uh, are not R&D. Uh, there's a fuzzy zone in between, and then there are aspects that are certainly R&D. Uh, and the complexity, well, uh, a complexity arises in that B zone there, which is a fuzzy zone, where we're not sure whether it's R&D or not. And we need deep expertise in order to uh, address and to, to look at that uh, issue. So, uh, in terms of, uh, and this is coming out of the Frescati definitions, uh, we need to carefully appraise projects uh, to ensure that they do meet qualifying uh, requirements. Uh, and the evidence and the evidence file, the doc documentation, uh, they have really to be addressed uh, in a professional uh, manner and recorded and reported properly. So, uh, I suppose that raises then the question uh, of what's the readiness level? Uh, I think um, uh, Martin used the word readiness as well. What's the readiness level of a company uh, for excellence in uh, R&D? Uh, and uh, I put together that, uh, that diagram there. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you look at it, uh, I don't have anything on the X and Y axis specifically, but uh, if you could imagine the gold standard for excellence is up at the top right hand side. And the, the lowest one is on the bottom left uh, in this, uh, this this Boston grid. Uh, then, if we can place a company somewhere on that uh, on that graph on that diagram, then we have an idea of where they stand. Uh, so that's some of the work that I've been doing. And um, without going into the detail here, uh, which I, I could do with you later on if you wish, uh, uh, I've done some uh, testing of a tool, developing development of a toolkit. Uh, and then testing of that toolkit. Uh, and so if we take a case where a company lands here, that's an actual result, in fact, of a company that I, that I did test uh, with a sensitivity analysis, uh, then you can see where the company is. Uh, and that tells us a lot about the company, its excellence, uh, but also a lot about where that company uh, might need to go to. So it gives us a path uh, towards uh, the uh, continuous development to get into the gold standard. Uh, and I think uh, that's where we need to be. Uh, so opening up that discussion and that capability of seeing where we are and where we're going to, uh, I think is, is a very important one. Uh, so what's needed in behind that then is uh, some sort of a toolkit. Uh, and uh, so I've been developing this toolkit where uh, I can quantitatively on both the X and the Y axis uh, undertake testing. Uh, and uh, so in this case, I'll just show you four tests. Uh, with an overall uh, dashboard results there uh, where the dot actually is uh, with some sensitivity. And then in behind that, a set of data, so proper data uh, analysis, the analytics there uh, to, uh, to uh, provide the detail uh, as to uh, as well, uh, the, the, the sub aspects as to the, the key issues in behind it. Uh, and so uh, something like that dashboard can interface both internally within a company. Uh, so if there's, a, for example, an R&D board and a, a responsible person in the company, like an R&D manager. Uh, so this system uh, would be uh, overseen by that uh, R&D manager, uh, and then interfacing with the, the senior management team within the company. Uh, but then I think as we're seeing some of the trends, like I mentioned about the revenue, that uh, we could interface also in real time with revenue, for example, as, as a vision, uh, which may be, uh, may be a significant change actually uh, within the, the country here. Uh, so a product that I'm developing is this, uh, what I'm calling a ready watch. Uh, so it's watching or uh, research development and innovation uh, in, within a company uh, in real time. Uh, so what, monitoring the readiness level uh, from the point of view of, uh, of where they're at relative to excellence. Uh, so uh, I was uh, coming to a conclusion, uh, this uh, six step approach that, that I've been looking at, one of them is an overall company calibration. 
that's not new and in fact I think Enterprise Ireland are rolling out a diagnostic system uh, so it's, it, it complies or it's consistent with the Enterprise Ireland approach there uh, undertaking a SWOT analysis of the R&D in the company and then going into this toolkit to, in a much more accurate way assessing where the company is at I've called that the BRL factor and the K factor uh, and then uh, reporting to an exchange with the company so uh, having those results then that discussion with the company uh, and then developing the, uh, you know, re, I suppose refining the company roadmap and the technology roadmap but then in particular coming out of that is the R&D roadmap uh, and then uh, I think what's also very valuable and important would be ongoing monitoring of this so it's not a, a single shot but it's a, an ongoing monitoring so you see that where that, that moves to uh, over a time axis. So that, uh, uh, in terms of conclusions, uh, this is kind of a, I suppose, the way an academic might present conclusions, so it's not a very nice uh, slide, uh, but just a few points. Uh, the landscape is certainly changing. Uh, much more complex, in my opinion, to assess or in the now than what it was and, and growing in complexity. Uh, the fuzzy zone uh, is uh, an area that is quite complex uh, but we need to have some way to address or to make decisions as to whether work that's being undertaken in the industry, whether it's, uh, it's R&D or whether it's not R&D. Uh, and so it's, is it, does it go beyond uh, a competent professional being readily able to achieve that? Uh, and then the, the KPIs in universities and industries are different. And one of the reasons why I say that is that uh, if an academic is using their own uh, metrics in assessing R&D in industry, then that's not the, that's, they're not the right metric. So we have to be very clear that the, uh, somebody assessing R&D should understand the metrics uh, of, uh, of the uh, industry. Uh, the severe competitiveness within the EU, we're seeing that with the H2020 uh, success rates uh, across Europe. Uh, so there's very severe competition there. Uh, the significance of the R&D tax credit uh, and now the knowledge development box, I think is growing in importance uh, for us uh, in, in Ireland. Uh, so uh, we have to, uh, I think we want to be very strong in that, in that space. Uh, so the target, as I see it, would be the achievement of real-time R&D uh, in, uh, and innovation monitoring. So how do we monitor and then undertake that in, in real-time? Uh, and then shifting, I suppose, well, achieving compliance is, is a must, uh, but then achieving excellence is a, is a direction that we need to be moving in. And then finally, uh, this toolkit that I'm talking about, uh, that needs development uh, in order to be able to, uh, quantif to quantify uh, the, uh, the status of the, uh, co the, the company R&D uh, and I'm currently at a, a beta testing stage of that toolkit uh, in, um, I'm wor working with companies uh, undertaking testing of that, that toolkit. So uh, that, that's the final slide. Uh, so uh, what I'm proposing really is that we need to go back and uh, in Ireland we should be able to demonstrate that we really are excellent in R&D uh, in, in the academic sense, uh, but also then in the industrial context. So we need uh, better, more quantifiable information uh, than what we currently have, and that's what I'm uh, proposing here. So Dennis, thank you very much. Thanks,